Uh, good evening. We're live on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maria Dantelo. I'm City Council candidate for District 6 on the Upper West Side. I'm a 40-year resident of the Upper West Side, mother of three children, and I'm very happy to be here this evening with my friend Sheldon Fine from Community Board 7. Um, I'm going to give you uh, the subject of tonight's program is uh, senior and supportive housing on the Upper West Side. Sheldon Fine is probably the uh, single most important voice in New York City and perhaps in the country on this important issue. So we're really honored to have him here tonight. I want to give you a little bit of background on um, Shel Shelley. Uh, I still have trouble calling you Shelley, as you know, as we discussed. No problem. Given your stature, it's Mr. Fine, but okay. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of background and then we're gonna go into a Q&A. And if you have any questions you would like to ask Shelley, please put them in the chat. We'd love to get to some of your questions. We're gonna try to do this in about a half an hour because we know at seven o'clock tonight, there is the mayoral debate, but uh, usually when we start talking, uh, <laughs> it doesn't always, uh, we don't always end on time. Um, okay, so um, this by the way, is part of our Hear, I Hear You Upper West Side series of programs. We've been doing these uh, live Zooms every week. Really, and, and we're, we're very happy to have a member of the community uh, this evening. We've had some other speakers as well. So um, uh, Shelley Fine is uh, really, as you know, everybody that I've been doing a series on Crown Jewels on the Upper West Side, great, great parts of our community and great parts of our neighborhood. And I have to say, Shelley is really one of the greatest uh, uh, jewels that we have on our Upper West Side uh, community. He's uh, a social activist. Uh, a leader on the West Side since 1971. He's uh, uh, the director of the uh, West Side um, Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing since 1979. Um, he's the chair of the local area policy board, neighborhood advisory board, community school board district th three, and vice chair of the citywide community action board. Uh, in addition, since 1986, he's been a member of community board seven on which he has held several leadership positions, including two very distinguished terms as chair of the board. He's also a friend uh, and a director of Friends of Bloomingdale Inclusive Park and Playground, supporting a uniquely constructed, truly inclusive park in Manhattan Valley. He's a career educator and has a, a great resume of um, his uh, involvement in our education in New York City. The West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing was formed in 1976. It's a coalition of social service agencies, religious institutions, and community organizations. Um, this organization has worked very well to bring communities together, is a, uh, a unifier, and they have worked tirelessly to create a new form of housing, something that really works, something that meets the diverse needs of older people and persons living with special needs. This is something that really we cannot underestimate the importance of leaders like Shelley in bringing this kind of housing to communities and cities where people who are suffering, who are older, and people living with special needs really aren't getting their needs met. So what he's done for that community cannot be underestimated. Their first building was in 1980. It was called the Marseille. It's called the Marseille and provides 134 independent apartments to low income elderly and handicapped individuals. So uh, Shelley and uh, his team over at uh, the West Side Federation really understand the needs of low income housing in communities and they also know how to do it successfully. In addition to serving independent seniors, they now serve frail elderly individuals, older persons living with serious mental illness, homeless individuals, and persons living with physically handicapping conditions, grandparents raising their grandchildren, as well as families. They house over 1,800 people in 24 buildings located all over Manhattan, the Upper West Side, Harlem, Chelsea, and the Bronx. All West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing is developed and run by this social service agency. This model integrates compassionate property management with on-site social services. We all know, we've all learned how important it is for housing to actually have the services that people need. 
They work with the residents and their mission is to provide that safe and affordable housing that supports the dignity of each individual and enhances community both inside and outside the buildings. And so what we're going to be talking about tonight is really how Shelley has made this senior and supportive housing work in the community, what his best practices have been, how he's gone about it, how he's worked with communities, and how he's really you know, made it possible for this important mission to be achieved so successfully. Um, just quickly before we start the questions, I just want to give a little bit of the demographics. Um, it, on the Upper West Side, which is really what we're going to focus on tonight is the Upper West Side, 8.7% of people are living below the po poverty line, which is about two thirds the rate of the New York 13% uh, level. And this is according to US Census statistics. The non-poverty level is about 91%. Seniors, the poverty rate is higher. It's 12% on the Upper West Side, which is about the rate overall in New York City. So we're seeing 12% of seniors living below the poverty line in our neighborhood about the same rate. So that's the introduction. And now we're just going to turn it over for the first question. Um, Shelley, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in this work? Okay, certainly. I just want to correct one thing. We now have 25 buildings, uh, excuse me, 31 buildings and 2,500 people. Fantastic. Okay. okay. And can you just uh, tell me what the change, how, how, how recent was that change from 1800 to? Uh, within the past few years, uh, built, we have buildings. We normally did one building every three years but we've done six in the past two or three years. Okay. So right away, there's been a jump and, and one, you know, there, and there are other things. There are buildings, three buildings together, which we can, can be, are really independent, but they're in the same. So we counted them as one. We decided since they have large numbers, we should count them as three. So it's that simple. And are they on the Upper West Side or are they around uh, different neighborhoods? Um, the most recent building, and people can walk by and see on 108th Street between Amsterdam and Columbus. Uh, we have uh, right now a building that's completed, which will house 79 families uh, and uh, about 110, I believe, um, individuals, mainly seniors. And then there'll be another building built a little later on. We had to wait three to five years because of an agreement with the community to build more. And that's brand new. And there are actually two, uh, two buildings, two separate buildings there. Um, but going back to how this all started, back in the 70s, I came to the West Side uh, because the most wonderful woman in the world lived on the West Side and I was tired of traveling. So I decided I might as well live here. And a year later, we came and lived together and got married uh, in 72. But what I saw right away in my synagogue and in the community were many elderly who were on fixed incomes and unable to continue living where they were living. There, was no, uh, there were no special programs, Section 8, SCREE, and all of these things at the time. And some people who were very dignified and very accomplished people were now uh, in jeopardy of not having a place to live. Then I read some very important research by Project Find. Now, Project Find is a secular group, non you know nonpartisan uh, activist group. That 65 percent of the poor elderly on the West Side were Jews of East European descent. It was shocking. Okay. Most people thought of West Siders as affluent, okay? And, but such a large percentage. So I looked deeper and in the process, we had a, that time a West Side Jewish Community Council that joined up with a bunch of other ch churches, synagogues and agencies in this fledgling West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing. And, what we saw right away, we went and visited people in single room occupancy hotels. And I'm just gonna give you an example of one, which will, will really illuminate the whole situation. Went with a uh, social worker, Kathy Greenstein, to a West Side uh, SRO 
where a woman named Hilda was living and she knocked on her door. She had five locks on her door uh, and five, I think four or five times uh, visits had to be made till she was willing to open up for Kathy. When we came in, the ceiling was half down. There was no hot water. One of her eyes was closed and she was sitting uh, looking life almost lifeless, you know, without any enthusiasm for life. Um, Kathy worked with her and convinced her to apply and she moved into the Marseille, our first building. Six months later, I live two blocks away. I was walking up Broadway and I see a woman in a very pretty dress with a shopping bag with her hair fixed. And she says, hello, Mr. Fine. And I said, hi, who are you? She says, I'm Hilda. And I said, oh, both eyes were open. She looked wonderful. She had, you know, rosy cheeks and life in her. I said, well, how do you like it here? It's wonderful, I have a new life. She, that's just one example, that's a, a stock example. But I'd like to just tell you one other thing. The Marseille at the turn of the 20th century, uh, 19th to 20th, was a luxury hotel. And it went down a little bit. And after World War II, it became the housing for Hyas, okay? Which brought in people who are Holocaust survivors. And that's what it was. And then eventually in the 60s and 70s, it became a welfare hotel. And when I moved here, there was violence there. There were shootings across the street. There was a building, the Alexandria next door, likewise populated. Uh, the West Side West Sider newspaper called it the most dangerous block in Manhattan. It's the block. I live up the block on West End Avenue. You walk from the subway. It was terrible. And the Marseille was our, our project, but we didn't have any money. And the Chinese embassy wanted to move there. It's a gorgeous building. Bankers Trust uh, gave us the seed money and eventually through federal state and city money, we established 134 senior apartments, mainly one bedrooms and, and um, and studios. And the strange thing, our first new resident, when she came in, someone interviewed her. And she said, when I came from Europe, this was the first place I lived. And we didn't know that. She ended up living the rest of her life in this beautiful place. So that's just one example of what can be. This was a hotel that was run down, that needed a gut rehabilitation, it was a blight upon the neighborhood in every way. And suddenly it became a place where people would walk by, how do I get an apartment here? Oh, you have too much money. You're not old enough, <laughs> okay? And uh, there it's, I think the, um, the waiting list and had to be closed at 5,000, okay? Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. I'd love to talk about how uh, people were able to get apartments in the Marseille. And, and also I'd like to hear today how that works in your in your housing. What is okay. the criteria for, for getting- Okay, because, because everything is government funded, okay? Although people pay rent, okay? It's all set, we've made most of our buildings section eight buildings. Mm -hmm. So people pay 30% of whatever their income is um, for rent and utilities, okay? So if someone has a thousand dollars income a month, it's $300 and you can work out the, the math. But when they apply, uh, today it's always online, but at those days it was, you know, people filled out applications. The, it was government supervised. Everything was done by lottery. There were certain buildings where there was a 49 or 50% a guarantee, a preference for local community, mm -hmm. okay, which we pushed for because we, we wanted our own people to have a, a better opportunity. And, but then there was a lottery and it was supervised and very strict. And it goes on today. Some of it's online today, 
okay, through Housing Connect and other uh, city uh, and other government um, uh, systems, but it's still by lottery. So we can't give, now there are situations where we can do exceptions, but they're unusual. If no one takes an apartment for six months in certain types of buildings, we can do what's called community. And we know someone who needs it, who fits the description, we can bring them in. But it's, we wish we could do that all over, but it's, it just doesn't work that way. The answer is there, to build more. <laughs> I know there are many people in the community who would love to see that number go up from 50% to a, to a higher number that we prioritize housing in the community for people who you know, have been living in the community for decades and maybe they're being, you know, I met a woman recently while, you know, campaigning, an older woman and her, her daughter, and, uh, her, and they expressed great concern about their maintenance. She was able to buy her apartment in an apartment conversion maybe 25 years ago, and the, but the maintenance has become so high that she's not sure she can stay in the neighborhood uh -huh. anymore. So we love to see our housing in the neighborhood uh, be allocated to people in the neighborhood who might be priced out otherwise. H how do you think we can, any ideas on how we can achieve, you know, I guess we have to lobby for that, I guess. It, there would have to be some unusual lobbying, you know, political. It's, it's about the 50% is about the best you can get mm -hmm. and you have to fight for it. You have to get that approval. Yeah. Um, five or six years ago, if you had asked me, are there people who need seniors who need housing? I'd say once every two months, I would meet someone because what ended up happening is um, a local elected official got up at a dinner, which happened to be attending where that person was being honored and said that I could take care of everything. As a result, a everyone said, hi, how are you? Right. You know, right. I heard you can take care of everything. So I, I got a, get a lot of calls, okay? It used to be one every two months. Now it's one every 10 days of someone who has legitimate housing needs in jeopardy of being evicted, in, je in jeopardy of not being able to stay where they are. And you think these people may just be poor people. Some people are poor and some people have had very bad times in their life. A lot of these people, the uh, former manager of a recording company, a uh, former um, uh, diamond and jewelry dealer, uh, someone who was a successful lawyer, who worked with some of the people who everybody has heard of as, as the best lawyers, uh, someone who was in uh, marketing and development and very successful. Uh, and then you say, how could these people be in this situation? And there are really two answers. Many of these people during the recession of 2008 lost their jobs, okay, and never could recoup. And that goes on. Uh, there are people now who have had those difficulties, but there are also people who were successful, but had either some mental health issue or some marital issue or what have you, and things went down and then they could not get themselves back together. Anyone who's had trouble with housing, if I did not know where I was going to sleep for three weeks and there was nothing in sight, I'd probably end up having mental health problems. Right. You know, a lot of people, had minor mental health problems or, or none. But over time, I've seen people deteriorate in their speech, in their appearance, in, in their certainly in their ability to function effectively. So the sooner we can help people, especially seniors, okay? And when I say seniors, there's a lot of definitions. We generally 62, federal 62 and above, but for certain buildings, we made it 50. We got the city to agree to 50 because someone who's 50 or 55 who's out of work gonna have a hard time getting back into the workforce, okay? The most important thing I wanna say is that we just don't house people. We have the social services, we have the support, and our goal is that they should be able to get on a path 
to getting back to where they were or to a better place. It's not just a housing thing. And with the Marseille, our executive director, Laura Jervis, an amazing human being, insisted on a social worker. And we said, why? She said, they need support. And so before there was a supportive housing network or the idea of supportive housing, every one of our buildings had case management and social service support. And it became the way we did, did business. So every one of our buildings, we have our own property management, our own social services, our own security, usually a front desk and so on. And the, the model has worked, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, was, I, I would love to uh, talk about the services in great detail. I just want to two mm -hmm. things first that um, I think the model of housing people in our community who are falling on hard times uh, and making sure that we have a housing stock that could, could, could help those people through a transition is, is just something I would love to see us prioritize. I think that's something that you've been doing that you've dedicated your career to. And I think the purpose of tonight is really to amplify just how important that, that goal is for us as you know, people age, as, as the population ages, people go through different cycles in their life. Um, we really wanna try to keep the elderly population in our community when they fall on hard times to make sure that we have a social safety net for them. Um, so definitely, I also just want to note that my cousin, Lee Danzilio, was a social worker in this neighborhood for, I think, 35 years. And uh, I would love to, you know, sort of see, I bet you she worked at, at one of your places way it's back. very possible. So um, we, have yeah. five, we have 500 employees. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> she's very committed to the neighborhood. And in fact, yeah. when we first moved into the neighborhood uh, in 1981. Um, she was here working as a social worker. Um, she worked, I think, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, 60s, 70s, 80s, probably into the mid 80s, and then she retired. But um, the neighborhood was so different back then, and right. And um, she went to my my parents and said, "I don't know about the Upper West Side. It's it really was a kind of yeah. a, a very dicey neighborhood." Uh, my, my wife used to say, we're not going to stay here. I said, I came here for you and I'm not leaving now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and my I, I, I just want to say something. Also. One thing that another strategy that worked was that we developed the community within the Marseille. And when the Red Oak, our second 106th Street, our second building, we moved, we trained people and we moved some of the original people into the new location. Oh, great. And so they recreated that community and that culture. And it's throughout the 31 buildings. And you say, how is that possible? And, and, and it has worked. The other, th so we, and we, so we've developed, you know, uh, staff that thinks a certain way, that acts a certain way, and not just the social workers, the porter, okay? The people have to be supportive of the people. We, you know, they're not just that person and to be that, is a problem. No, how can I be nice to that person and, and be helpful to them? And to me, that's the most heartwarming, heartwarming thing. But it was, you know, I, I'm getting a lot of credit here. We have the most amazing people working for us, the most amazing staff. And each one is, is a gem. And you say, how do you get them? They were willing to take less pay to be a part of something that they thought was very special. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so we're very fortunate. Yeah, um, I've, I've met a few people uh, last uh, a couple of months while campaigning who work uh, in various uh, facilities around the neighborhood. Um, and uh, I've, you know, you know, I've met some great people for sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay. They are currently living in the neighborhood. Sometimes they live in another neighborhood, but we really do have some great, great employees. Can you talk a little bit about the services and the model and how? Sure. Mm -hmm. Especially with okay. people with special needs, mm -hmm. seniors, and people with um, mental with suffering with a mental uh, health challenge. Sure. So, as I said, everyone has a case manager, whether they need one or not. Okay. So we want we want to be in contact with each person because things develop, you know, in life. So someone may be the most together individual who can, is independent happens to be in one of our buildings, uh, qualified financially and so on. 
And then all of a sudden they, they've lost someone, okay? Or they're going through a difficulty for whatever reason. And, and then they need support. So instead of waiting for a problem, they have a regular visit with their social worker, it's expected. And depending on their needs, and certainly those who need um, to gain uh, things that they're entitled to that they don't have, or connections to health centers and hospitals, all that's arranged by the social workers. So everyone is getting health care. In some of our facilities, we have a health clinic, like the 108th Street is going to have one on site, not only for people there, but the people in the community, immediate community. But uh, through uh, Jewish Home, 1,100 of our uh, residents uh, in the past six or seven years have used the services, daycare, in other words, of the Jewish Home. Um, and Mount Sinai Hospital and Ryan Center and so on. But what we provide on, on uh, site, depending on the need, is individual counseling, which may be just a social worker, but if necessary, a psychologist, psychiatric consultation where it's deemed necessary. We had one the other day, the, the best building where everybody is really terrific and this guy's going through terrible times and is speaking to the daughter. And the daughter says, I don't know what's happening to my father. And we got a con psychiatric consultation. He needed a lot of help. And together with the family, we usually work with the family uh, instead of just trying to, you know, they're not ours, they right. will, you know, unless they don't have anybody. Um, case management by men, full-time visiting nurse, okay, in our larger buildings. So there's always someone there. So if, although it's not a facility, okay, it's not a health facility, it's not a senior facility, if people need a nurse, okay, at any time, they have, they don't have to call 911, okay? Right. Um, there's teams of uh, program aides, uh, certain buildings have a program during the day recreation for those who need it. Um, uh, one building had an exercise program done by a local um, physical therapist who's a PhD. And he came and he knew that if you do this exercise, it helps the kidney and this one helps the you know, other organ. And he actually worked with them and it was free to our uh, residents who had, had Medicare or Medicaid. So we've even done that. Um, there's programs, there's uh, holiday celebrations. To, so anyone can take advantage of it and even trips. Uh, but some, for some people, it's a whole life. I and mean, some people, it's just a nice thing to have. Yeah. But it encourages socialization and the feeling of community. And the isolation of elderly is what we're fighting most. Many yes. of these people were isolated before for one reason or another. Those who had family close by uh, generally were able to figure out what to do. But many of the people, it's shocking, uh, they don't have anybody or the person they might have is not accessible to them. So we have to be. The, there's the extraordinary things. Uh, Laura Jervis, our executive director, and I took turns. Um, there was a man who uh, was very, very ill one day and he was up at St. St. Luke's now uh, west uh, uh, Mount Sinai West Morningside. Um, and we took turns with him in the emergency room. And people said, why? And until we could get other people. Because if you go to the emergency room and you have a family member with you or a friend, they will advocate for you. If you don't have anybody in the world, we have to be that family. Okay. Yes. So generally, I, I wouldn't be the person. I'm not a paid staff person. But I heard I knew him and uh, knew of him. And our executive director wasn't in. I said, where is Laura? And they said, oh, she's at St. Luke's. I said, what happened? She's with so our staff will take on other roles uh, because, as family would. It's a sense of family. Even our cooks, where we have a uh, meal serve in, in some, will take a personal interest in people and make sure they get exactly what they need, not only in terms of this amount of salt, this amount of sugar, but this amount of loving care when they serve it to them. You know, 
So I think you're giving people who are watching a sense of why you're so important. Um, I mean, this is just great work that you're doing. Can you talk a little bit about how the what you've been doing to get through the pandemic and whether there are uh, challenges with congregant settings? Well, so some of our buildings are, are separate apartments, a number of them. But let's take the Euclid Hall on 86th yes. Street, okay? And if people don't recognize it, can you sh share a screen? Uh, I think that's, uh, I probably- If you can't, it's okay. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you where it is. Between 85th and 86th, it's the whole mm -hmm. block of Broadway on, on the, the west, west side. side. Right. And it's halfway down the block. And there's 273 single rooms. Now in each room, in each one person per room, and there's a suite of three. It's lovely. It's really lovely, the suite. Everyone has a separate key to their apartment, to their room, and a key to their suite. But there's one very clean, sanitized bathroom for the three. It used to be one to 12 in the old days. The Euclid Hall was a horrible place. It was a single room occupancy with, we saw five locks on the door. We saw piles of garbage of cups and, and, um, and plates and things almost halfway up higher than the waistline of most people, uh, drug dealing and everything, but it was okay, it was privately owned, okay? Eventually, when we took it over, by the way, there was a protest outside the building on the street, the whole uh, block, protesting what we were doing. And I was saying, how can you protest this? Look what was there before, you know? But people were afraid. Eventually, we met with those people and they, they were encouraging to take more seriously needy people. And we said, it doesn't fit into our, uh, you know, they can't have had, can't have in the last five years a drug or, or, or um, any type talk, of substance talk about, use. Yeah. So, you know? so you had some criteria to get Oh, in. yeah. There was a lot of criteria. What were they? Oh. Um, so one, uh, no substance abuse in the, you know, in the, uh, in the past five years, at least it was. Um, uh, history, living with someone, no violent background, no criminal background, uh, consistency in paying their rent except in extraordinary times. Um, uh, the ability uh, in an interview to, uh, to show some social ability, okay? Um, what else? Uh, so either some connection with family, okay? Uh, or um, some individual that they could that they could show they have a long time relationship with could be a friend because uh, the idea was that people are going to have to live together there, okay? And um, of course there was a financial thing they had to be under a certain amount and I was curious they, about that. Yes, they had to have a certain um, they had if they did not have Medicare. A Medicaid or Medicare, they had to apply for it okay. because we needed to, they had, had to take responsibility for the healthcare. So our thing was if they didn't have certain things that we could ex help them access, we did, but they had to be uh, potentially a good residence. Why? First for the community, but really first, you're living with other people. If, if you have a neighbor who's a pain in the neck, and doing right. things and, and making noise and, and not, your life is miserable. We were bringing people there to have a better life and to protect our staff, okay? Was there so an age the, requirement too? An age? 50 and above there. 50 and above for Euclid. Yeah, okay. the, the city wanted, you know, adult 21 and above. And we said, we will get mainly younger people Younger people who are not getting their act together are much more difficult. We can't handle it, okay? Right. We don't know how to manage those numbers. Give us 20, give us right. 25 or 30, give us the place, we probably could do it. Uh, so they said, but we have to add more people. I said 50 and above works. And so we have a few places where 50 above. Generally, it's, it's the uh, federal uh, standard. So ask me the question again, because I, so I get all, Was it all, all men in-, in Oh, the, no. Oh, no, it's mixed. 
Okay. It's mixed men and women. In fact, one uh, gentleman who was homeless for 10 years and got there on the community thing after, you know, there, ended up meeting a woman there. Okay. And they started a relationship. Okay. And then they came to me and said they're getting engaged. So I gave them marital uh, counseling. Okay. I said to her, is he responsible enough to carry, use, you know, hold him to these things, let him prove himself? She was a doll. She, you know, she was a lovely person. I said, I don't know you, but I can tell by your, and PPS, they're married. They applied for uh, housing. They're now living in the Bronx and they have a wonderful marriage with their dog. Okay. Oh, wonderful. And they lived happily ever after. That's great. But that's an example of, uh, there are men and women there. We don't match them all up, but they get along and it's more normal. There it's are men normal. in the world. It's a community. In the world. Yeah, all but we're men. talking about the congregant settings. Um, oh, oh yeah. so the congregant settings. So what happened? And don't get scared, okay? In December, our amazing staff met with our board and said, we are contacting the Department of Aging that partly funds us. And we're going to ask them to move people out to a hotel, okay? Out to a hotel because we can't have three people living using one bathroom. Right. Okay. And I'm also team chief of the community emergency response team. So I was getting calls from the office of emergency management, New York City emergency management, asking me to make phone calls to hotels to find what's available. Oh no. What does this sound like? Yes. So we found a hotel on 58th street and 12th Avenue. Okay. Where the very few people live, but was a very good, well-run hotel. And we took, I think half of our people went there into separate rooms. Each one had their own room. That was the whole point. Our social workers were assigned there who were working with them. We insisted on the city providing a health, a, a doctor or a nurse and another health aide there to, to, to test people every, you know, to take temperatures, to be in touch with people because we heard that COVID there's a, especially with older people, they were crashing all of a sudden. Okay, it's six in the evening, not good at 10. So we had them constantly in communication. And every one of those people, and we had another hotel too, every one of those people, no one died. Fantastic. Okay, everybody was responsible. Okay, right. one person was not responsible, the guy who ended up getting married. He called me from Queens saying he got a, um, the maintenance job for the night. And I said, get yourself back to that hotel or you're going to be on the street. You know, mm -hmm. he says, but I'm making money. I said, don't worry, just get yourself back. Okay. And, and then one third came back one third, every one per three. Right. And when we knew when everyone was okay and responsible and, and proved it, we moved the people back. Just as some of the vac first some of the vaccines started coming out, when everyone else was looking for vaccine, our people were being vaccinated in the lobbies of their buildings. Just oh, they great. said they couldn't do it, the city. We had the list in December and early January made up for each building. We got people to sign off that they wanted it. They had counseling about has what they call now hesitancy which I think is a lot more than hes hesitancy. Uh, there were a few people here and there who wouldn't take it. And we had them vaccinated once and then twice, okay? Uh, by the middle of March or end of March, I think we had uh, over 1,500 of our people vaccinated twice, okay? Fantastic, out of okay? 2,500, so now, that's- at, at that time, and then, right. and, and, and we went on. All the things that couldn't happen, what I, why I went like this before is six weeks after we successfully did the hotel thing, the mayor came out with the hotel thing. Oh boy, yes, we know what, where that, what happened with that. Okay, but it wasn't done the same way, okay? Mm -hmm. We prepared the people for it. We made the arrangements. We made sure the, the, the resources were with the people. 
we had a, a deadline for how long they were going to be there unless something unusual happened. There was, it was all thought out and planned out well, and it was successful. And the only problem we had was that we got a couple of calls because we had buses to take the people to um, the hotel. And they said, what's happening? The Euclid Hall is being emptied out. They're being evacuated. What happened there? And I said, don't worry, the people are getting help. What happened inside? Nothing bad happened inside. That's why we're moving them out. They're in congregate setting. So that's one example, okay? Uh, it I, has just to wanna, be I just wanna say, I did not hear one negative thing about anything your organization handled. It was handled seamlessly, effectively, and most important, lives were saved. You know, they, lives were saved and people, you know, I, the, as you just said, the community wanted the residents to, they were worried about them because yeah. you've done such a great job of, of bringing the community in to I, how- I have to say, it's our executive director, Brilliance, his connection, our executive staff's connection with city agencies, Sometimes it's rocky, but always, always engage with them right. and making demands. We're not sending them there without health people there. We're not sending them there without regular food delivery. We're going to have all the services there before they leave their current situation. Right. And, and we're just so thankful to God that, that we didn't have the tragedies that could have happened. Things Thank can you. be done right. Okay, unfortunately, when people take pieces of a plan and don't make a, a comprehensive plan that takes into all the considerations, sometimes bad things happen. I also want to note that when you managed to do this so effectively, it was the worst time of the pandemic. You know, I and your people were still working really hard to make this happen. I mean, this was way before the mayor's, you says you said six weeks before uh, the mayor's announcement. And I, I, those, you know, we've all lived through this pandemic. I, I know those months you were talking about were, you know, very confusing for people. And so I, I commend your organization, you and your executive director and your leadership um, for, for, for effectively uh, executing a plan that saves so many lives. Um, I worried about the seniors all through the pandemic. Um, it was a big concern. Those of us who were involved with the community board, we, um, not with your committee, mm -hmm. overall just worried about seniors in congregant settings in the nursing homes and, uh, and, and, and other places that, you know, it just seemed like if, if they, your, your, your universe of people were well taken care of, but not everybody had a Sheldon Fine to look out for them. Let me tell you, not only our executives, but each building has caring managers, directors, social service people, and we have a social service network. So when the need is greater in this building, we bring people from one place to the other. Just like when we have physical issues with the, the boiler, we have people come from other places who have, we have such a large network. And again, you can't find people like this. One, one woman who did uh, our finances for many years, I sat down with her maybe 10 years ago. And I said, what are you doing here? You could be in any corporation making fortune. She said, but I'm having a wonderful life. Mm. I know what I'm doing here. And let me tell you, I checked the, the rates. She was about half of what she could make, she was making. So we're trying to do better on that because we, we do our own, we get uh, some, um, whatchamacallit, what are they called? Uh, development fees when we do new things. So we put them aside and when we can give a bonus or give something to these great people, we do it. But um, they're dedicated, they're really dedicated. That's what great leaders bring out in people. Um, tell me a little bit about good neighbor policy. Ah. I, that's something that's come up a lot in the sure. you know, hotels that were used to house people during the pandemic sure. caused a lot of problems. Any, any homeless shelter, okay? It's not every type of building, but homeless shelters must have a good neighbor 
policy. It's a part of it. It's it's not highlighted in the on a website, but it's a standard, and usually not much is made of it. Okay, but we have one transitional shelter. It was Valley Lodge on 108th, which is going to be reproduced. Mm -hmm. It's on 85th between West End and Riverside while we're waiting for the built new building to open. And by the way, we've only had concern from neighbors if they thought two, two men were in the park and they were sitting close together and smoking. And they were concerned they were sitting too close together and, and, and the health, you know, because of COVID. And that was a concern, not, oh, those people, nothing like that. The people on the block have been wonderful. So what's the good neighbor policy? Good neighbor policy usually includes um, certain behavior. It's unacceptable. You can't hang out in front of the building, okay? It's not a hangout. Um, you shouldn't be even across the street under someone's window because smoke, if you want to smoke, smoke rises, okay? So um, in terms of use, use, of, dr uh, use of drugs, Okay, if it's not authorized, if you, you know, you have to deal with the social worker and, and getting help, if that'll help. If not, if you're beyond help, you can't be there, okay, after a time. But certainly if you're, we haven't had this, fortunately, from our own people. If you're dealing in drugs, you're, you're you know, you're out, okay? And we don't want our own residents to have negative influences, okay? A acting, uh, certainly violence is out. You know, you don't need three strikes to certain things. Um, bad uh, behavior with other people, you know, uh, you get counseled if it continues and there are complaints two or three times, depends on the individual and what the other side was and bringing people together. Um, you're not eligible to continue because you're disrupting people's lives. They're there to, to not only be housed, but to, to have a better life and you're making it impossible. So somehow, as someone told me uh, about our Valley Lodge, they've never had a, they live on the street and they never had a problem with any of those people. They expect it to. They must, some of them have mental health issues for sure and so on. But they realized that there's going to be consequences to certain behaviors. There's also other pieces. If you're in a transitional shelter, if you disappear for a week, you're in jeopardy of losing your space. I see. Because people are. There is a curfew. It's usually 10 o'clock. Okay. If you're in an emergency, you call and you say, I'll be there 15 minutes late but it shouldn't be regular, right. okay? There are exceptional situations, but it's regulated in the shelter because trying to get people on track to act responsibly and to be good, good neighbors, okay? Both inside and outside. Um, and respectful to the extent that they deserve it to our staff, okay? Right. A person can be angry at a staff member and maybe it's, Maybe it's legitimate. They didn't do right. something they asked for. But how you deal with it has to become better because the goal is permanent housing, living right. in the community with other people. And it's just not acceptable. If they haven't developed those skills, this is the opportunity. This is the transition that they have. Right. Most of our people in the transitional place, 98% uh, I believe at one point, I know it's, it's still 95%, achieved permanent housing, okay? When the past few years, we had a few people who were, had been so well off before that this, they just couldn't take living in this situation anymore. And so they had a friend, they went to live with a friend. But it's, it's a high, high percentage. And they um, got permanent housing, but they did because they were able to be recommended by their social worker for some permanent housing because they conducted themselves in a responsible way, both inside and in the surrounding community. So, great. yeah. Yeah, um, I just, one more question. Uh, of course. Wrap up. Uh, it's not quite on what we discussed, but I, you and I sure. talked 
bit about, uh, I was really moved by the stories you told me about people you've helped who are experiencing street homelessness, who are unhoused, living on the street. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about steps that the community can take to uh, address the street homelessness problem. I know okay. that quite in your, um, you know, mission well, of your program. My, my your wife will tell you <laughs> that her husband knows all the people on the street. I, that's well. You told me that. I mean, and it drives her and it coats and dinner. It, it, and it, 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 it used to drive her crazy, but now she's accustomed to it. As long as I don't stop too long. You know, oh, okay. I know. Okay. You told me about winter time when people were yeah. sleeping yeah. out and you were worried yeah. about them and brought them brought them food and and gave them your dinner and coats. I mean, you've done so much for the community. So 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 let let's work. talk about the street homeless. Ultimately, that's going to be the big issue when this COVID is over and if the hotel yeah. situation works itself out. And I've been telling people the real problem is people who are homeless on the street. Now, some of the people you see on the street are not homeless. Okay. Yes, we okay. have learned that. Yes. Okay. That. So, so don't assume, with that. So don't make yeah. assumptions. Yes. But there are, there are, Three things that have worked, okay, that, that I have been involved with. One of them uh, is the Safe Haven program, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, Goddard Riverside is the agency for Manhattan for street homelessness, for home, homeless services. So the, their outreach program will go if someone's identified and they're in the same place all the time and speak with them and try to encourage them. And as soon as a spot is available in a safe haven, now what's a safe haven shelter? A safe haven shelter probably has no more than 30 to 35 people at a time. Most people, especially in COVID are separate. They can come and go somewhat, certainly more than in other places. It's not as restrictive. They can accept services. They don't have to accept all services. So it's less restrictive. I have found that people who are not willing to do anything else may over time are willing to do that. And they'll either bring them to a safe held haven, shelter, there's one in the community, okay? And no one knows where it is because it hasn't been a problem in the last five years since it's been there. Or to a Y that might be a little out of the neighborhood where there's a available room, okay? With the services there from the, the outreach agency. I've seen people's lives turned around in a short time. They get them all their entitlements and they have a regular place to sleep and they feel they can leave in the morning and, and visit people and do what they want to do and eat what they want to eat and they're not restricted. So that's one good model and I advocate for it. We do not have one in most of our community. One's uptown, but it's still in our community. Um, Number two, uh, people who are on the street, okay, and have determined that they want to be there forever, okay, uh, I think over time, uh, supportive counseling can make a difference with some people. Are there intransigent people? They're going to be some. They're going to be some. Um, I think certain things should be done in terms of re regulation and change in law. If people, I've, we've seen these encampments, right. okay? And some you could justify and some are a bit much and there needs to be some uh, a compassionate uh, regulation that says you can, this is as much as you can do. Beyond yeah. this, you can't say that because it's not good for the people, okay? They may not, a person who is not able to make good decisions for themselves. Right. If they lived in your building, you could uh, try to get family or, or go to a mental health uh, service and try to get them help. Or call, if they're hurting themselves, call the police. Right. Okay, to help. Why should it be different? But it has to be done in a way that's, that's not, Cruel. Okay. Yeah. I don't know all the answers, but there are answers. And I think if people 
get together and say, we want to solve the street homeless problem. And the good part about it, it helps those people and it helps the community. It's yeah, a win-win. I mean, it's, good, it's good to know about uh, the Goddard outreach for people listening that we can mm -hmm. you know, call Goddard and, and see if uh, you know, they can address it, especially with people who, as you said, um, you know, are really need counseling and services. And I think your point is well taken that, um, you know, that, that people who are living on the street are making a choice that really might, you know, if they had some counseling and some help, they might think it through a little more, you know, realistically that it's really not safe to be living on the street. It's, it's, you know, it's dangerous and you could die living, you know, out in the cold. I mean, those of us who, you know, walk, you know, go out and walk around the neighborhood in the, in the winter, you know, I'm a big walker and the cold weather doesn't bother me at all. It always makes me very upset to see people living on the street, you know, not, not warm, not, not, not properly dressed. And so I think it's great to, to have a plan that could help, you know, address this problem. So, um, but thank you. I think we're close okay. to wrapping up, unfortunately. Okay. Whenever we talk, it, it <laughs> Flies and um, when, but it's when, good. when Marie it's good. said, "Can you do this in a half an hour?" I said, "No, we can't. It's not going to happen." So okay. I can't thank you enough for sharing all of your uh, wisdom and for your dedication to uh, the, the community in the Upper West Side. And um, you know, we just everybody just really appreciates your 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 service. Um, and I I, ju I just hope enough. I, I what I always ask the community for is listen to this the possible solutions okay yeah. be open to think about it because they they usually will benefit themselves by it okay yes. compassionate smart solutions for people who are struggling benefit that person which we all want but also benefit the community ultimately Totally. I mean, I think that's what I love about our neighborhood. And I say this all the time that we are a deeply compassionate community. And that's in our DNA as, as Upper West Siders. So I'm Maria Danzelo. I'm running for city council. Election is June 22nd. Um, uh, you can order your mail in ballot now for June 12th, which starts. And most important, well, most important, vote Maria number one, um, but vote, it's really important. We have a really big election coming up. Um, you know, we're 35 of 51 seats are turning over, mayor, controller, borough president. So it's really important to our community we get leaders in who are going to help Sheldon Fine do the great work he is doing and have the resources to do the great work he is doing. So we need to get our economy back, back up and running. And I, you know, and we'll continue, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to support the great work you're doing. I just you. want us to come back from this pandemic. So okay. thank you for time. Okay, we'll see you at the next CB7 meeting. Okay. okay, have a good night. You too, thank you.